In this segment, I want to get into Yagi antennas. Now, before I get into it, I want to say that building a microwave Yagi antenna is very difficult. And as we should all know by now, creating any form of antenna, the higher the frequency, the smaller your wavelength is going to be. Now, because we're in 2.4 gigahertz, everything has been down to like you know a tenth of a millimeter, a half of a millimeter, something that's really hard to do. And with Yagi antennas, building them, especially with hand tools, are very difficult. Now, I don't want to discern you from this, but personally, I have not been able to get any kind of significant performance from a 2.4 gigahertz Yagi antenna. Now, the Yagi antenna was designed in the early 1920s by Professor Yagi, and uh, that's about it. A basic Yagi antenna will look a lot like this, or your typical TV antenna. It's going to have a whole bunch of these horizontal or vertical elements, a driven element, typically of a dipole fashion, and a reflector element. Now, I'll use this one for example. Now, this is, was supposed to be a 15 decibel gain, 2.4 gigahertz Yagi antenna. What this consists of is, I think, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 parasitic elements. All of these elements are called parasitic elements. What their job is to do is to function as reflectors. Now, each one of them is 5% smaller than the one behind it. So, this one is 5% smaller than this one. This one is 5% smaller than this one, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And what these are going to do is it's going to manipulate your radiation field, your radio estimated radiation pattern, your ERP, or your radio field. And as the radio waves hit, it's going to reflect it to the next one back in a domino fashion. So all of, all of these are going to want to pick up radio signals from all positions. And then you're going to have the second to last element right here. I'll try to get a nice picture. That right there, that I'm wiggly, that is going to be your dipole, your driven element. Your driven element, as you should know by now, is your active receiving portion of the antenna. This is what's going to hook into the coax and feed the signal to and from your actual transceiver, in this case, a Wi-Fi card. And then this last element right back here, that's a reflector for any radio waves that might have actually skipped past all of the parasitic elements. Now, as with all antennas, depending on your frequency, will determine the actual size of your antenna. Now, I'll put a lot of information in the show notes on how to actually calculate your antennas and wiki articles and even online calculators that do all the think thinking for you. But well, up until this point, we've only really worked with one type of dipole, which is just a typical dipole, which means you have a wire going one way horizontally and then the other way with no significant gap in the middle, or vertically. Um, with some antennas, there is a folded dipole, and a folded dipole means it's an actual loop. The distance between the loop and the size of the loop and the arc and the bends and all that stuff will actually change the impedance of the actual signal. And the, the impedance needs to be matched to the actual coax, so the coax does not resist the flow of the electrons through the actual cable, which is why you need to get good coax. You can't use shitty stuff. Now, this Yagi antenna was actually quite forgiving. This was designed for the amateur radio 70 centimeter band. It's beat up, it's fugly, and it's literally half-assed, but it works, and it works really well. It gives me six decibels of gain on the amateur radio uh, 70 centimeter band, which falls in the 440 megahertz range. Each one of these parasitic elements is literally just, sorry, these, these two are parasitic elements right here. This is literally household electrical wiring. It's either 14 or 16 gauge copper wire, and it's literally just stapled to a piece of old wood. This was All of this junk was laying in my lab. Then we have a couple of uh, a standard dipole that is matched to the center frequency. And then we have our back reflector right over here. And this will comprise a relatively portable Yagi antenna and it feeds to my coax and down to my radio. And of course, because this is at 400 and say 50 megahertz and this is at 2400, you can suspect if you were to make one of these 15 elements, it would come out to about roughly six feet long. It's not something quite handheld as a 2.4 gig. But the measurements on these are, are a lot more forgiving because it's a lower frequency and you can be off center frequency with your measurements. Now, uh, as for building them, now I'll give you a couple of tips that I use for building all of my Yagis despite whether they work or not. Try to work with some kind of flat piece of wood. Now, it does not matter if your material, this piece right here, which is called the boom, which is the piece that holds all of the elements, is conductive or not. That'll just determine on which types of calculations you have to have to make. If you do have a conductive piece of material that's electrically conductive, of course, a piece of metal, aluminum, steel, copper, brass, whatever, if it's electrically conductive, it cannot be touching your driven element. 
So voltage dipole or not, you have to isolate your driven element from the conductive boom. This is why I typically stick with wood or plastic. It's just a lot easier to try to not get it to conduct. Now, any kind of wire will work um, on this antenna, which is actually the exact copy of this. This was just made out of three millimeter strips of aluminum. This was made out of three millimeter diameter um, brass rod. You can, I got that. You can get it at most home hardware stores. If you don't have any, you could use where is it? Ah, old wiring you get out of your your house, 16, 14 gauge uh, solid copper wire, or you could use old coat hangers, which is what I used for this little son of a bitch. Now, with this one was a pain in the ass because trying to drill holes on a round pipe completely straight with any kind of drill is extremely excruciating. It's very difficult to do. So, if you can get some kind of square structure instead of a round wood, definitely, definitely recommend it. So, I got some old wood laying around the lab and I drilled all the holes. You can also use plexiglass, but plexiglass is a little flimsy and it really won't stand up to a lot of wind. So, if you want to put it outside, it's really not going to hold up too well. But, it's really good for handheld stuff because it's really light. As you can see, this thing probably weighs about four or five ounces. I mean, I can throw this thing across the room and no problem. This, on the other hand, weighs close to about a pound and a half. So, now, as for drilling the holes, I've actually created a kind of funky device. This is a typical router accessory attachment for my rotary tool, the Dremel, which, you know, some people, most of you should have something similar. And there's supposed to be um, a screw or a bolt right here that actually locks it into a specific depth. This is used for actually routing the grout on your tile work or actually routing um, finishing touches on wood. I actually got my, myself a spring. This spring was actually uh, salvaged from an old standing fan, like the adjustable kind. So now I actually have something that I can push in and auto return. So what I can do is I can actually lay this in a clamp, put this down, and when I push on it, drill through it, and then it automatically returns, or at least make some kind of punch into the wood, and then come by again with the Dremel, with the Dremel or a slow drill or whatever, and then continue to go into it. Now, this really was easy as sin to make. It was, if I can get the damn thing apart. Like I said, it's just a spring. If you can find one, I'm sure you can improvise something. You're watching BSOD, you probably have an IQ above room temperature by now. And then we have the Dremel accessory. So um, that's about that. Uh, if you have access to a drill press, you can actually talk to Nate. He did have access to a drill. I had access to a drill press, and I still wasn't able to get all the holes drilled properly. For 2.4 gig, it's just a real pain in the ass. Now, I've also been developing this method, which is the aluminum foil and plastic technique. This is a 915 megahertz. Um, Yagi antenna, a parasitic element, parasitic, 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 driven element, which if you can see is just a standard dipole, there's no fold in it, doesn't wrap around. And then here is our reflector, which leads into my radio scanner. It's also in a nice handheld form, so it's relatively light, it's got some mass to it, it's got some structure, it's a little bulky, it's a prototype, but it works really well. Now all I did was take three millimeter wide aluminum tape, I calculated my antenna dimensions and the impedance level of the coax and what frequency I wanted it for, and I just used these strips of metal precisely calculated on the actual plexiglass, and I cut the plexi plexiglass to shape. I have better pictures of this thing on my Picasso page. If you're interested, I can put links, um, as well as this son of a bitch right here. I mean, it's, it's the same principle. It's just the reason this one really didn't work primarily was because um, the tape itself was ha had to be cut by hand, and uh, it was cut wrong. So they're not all exactly three millimeter widths. On this, it doesn't matter so much because it's a lower frequency. It's more forgiving towards mistakes. This, on the other hand, you got to be dead on. And then I know for a fact that the actual five percent width uh, increase of width on each one of the parasitic elements is not accurately measured. Now I'm going to take another whack of the uh, whack at this one. I have some more time in the next couple of weeks and I'll post some conclusions on whether or not this 2.4 gigahertz design will or will not work. Right now, this does not work. Right now, for me, this does not work. Now, if you have access to machine shop tools or any kind of precision machine stamping tools, you're really, really patient with a Dremel, I'd really suggest tackling this project. If you're impatient like me and you really don't have the desire or the care to make such a large antenna, I mean, this thing is supposed to yield 15 decibels of gain. 
But then again, the bi quad that I did a couple of segments ago, that will yield about 12 decibels of gain. The bi quad is, in my opinion, easier to make. Its parts are more readily available. It's a bit more versatile. The Yagi, on the other hand, if you got access to machine shop manufacturing processes can be easily mass produced by the thousands by the hour. It's just a matter of trying to get that folded dipole or your standard dipole isolated if you have an, uh, have an actual metallic conductive boom. So this will pretty much conclude my segment. I'll put a lot in my show notes. Um, I really don't know what else to say. I really hope I didn't discern you from trying to make a Yagi antenna. But to tell you the truth, in my personal opinion, if you want a Yagi antenna for the higher frequencies, like 2.4 gigahertz, you're honestly better off buying one man uh, professionally manufactured rather than trying to build it yourself. Go ahead and try it. If it works for you, congratulations. That's great. I'd really love to hear your build process. Take lots of pictures. Let us know how it goes. But for me, I think I'm done for it with them. 2.4 gigahertz Yagis, sorry. Too hard for me to make.